It's Friday, March 26th, fan. The time for your Bobby is to be one news update. A mental health and wellness committee will be established to assess the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic over the past year on students and teachers. Education Minister Santia Bradshaw made the announcement last evening during a post-cabinet press conference in which she announced the reopening of schools on a face-to-face -face phased basis beginning Tuesday, April 20th. She said everything must be done to assist students and teachers during this tough time. We have taken the view after much consultation with our Ministry of Health and Wellness, um, persons within the psychiatric hospital, um, a number of the counsellors who have spoken to both students as well as to, to parents and certainly to teachers over the course of this last year, that what is first important to us is to be able to assess and to see where our students are. And so as we return to the classroom environment, it is our intention that we will establish a mental health committee a mental health and wellness committee, I should say, to be able to look at how our children have fared during this period as well as our teachers. And it is not something that we want to do just as a one-off. We want to ensure that we can follow the progress of these students and to provide the necessary support to them as well as to their teachers over the course of at least the next three years because it has not been easy for any of us or any of them to be able to cope with this particular transition. Minister Bradshaw acknowledged that the ministry will not always get things right and will face challenges as it moves forward with trying to bring back some level of normalcy to the teaching and learning process. We have taken the view after much consultation with our Ministry of Health and Wellness, um, persons within the psychiatric hospital, um, a number of the counsellors who have spoken to both students as well as to, to parents and certainly to teachers over the course of this last year, that what is first important to us is to be able to assess and to see where our students are. And so as we return to the classroom environment, it is our intention that we will establish a mental health committee, a mental health and wellness committee, I should say, to be able to look at how our children have fared during this period as well as our teachers. And it is not something that we want to do just as a one-off. We want to ensure that we can follow the progress of these students and to provide the necessary support to them as well as to their teachers over the course of at least the next three years because it has not been easy for any of us or any of them to be able to cope with this particular transition. Much needed cash will be in the hands of some terminated Barbadian NIAT workers shortly after months of frustration and suffering. Speaking during the estimates debate this week, Attorney General Dale Marshall told Parliament these workers should have been paid by the Antigua and Barbuda government because they contributed to that country's social security severance fund. He, however, contended that the Barbados government was not legally obligated to pay those workers a severance, but out of a sense of humanity and care, the Mia Mosley administration will be ready with the details of a payout soon. This caring government decided that we would leave no one to the wolves. And as far back as I think July or August last year, we gave every single one of those employees, whether they, they paid in here or paid in Antigua, we gave everyone a payment. We have determined that it would be appropriate to see how we could make some kind of, of payment ex gratia, internal ex gratia basis to those unfortunate souls who work for LIAT, were contracted in Antigua, but who live here. But it is an ex gratia payment that would be made when the details are worked out. Minister Marshall explained that there were two sets of Barbadian Liat workers who were terminated by the Antigua-based airline. One set of Liat workers were employed by Liat in Barbados, and those workers paid contributions into the NAS. Liat also paid contributions into the NAS on behalf of those Barbados workers. Again, they were employed by Liat in Barbados 
and statutory contributions were, were made out of their wages and on behalf of the employer to the NIS. There is a legal obligation on the part of the national insurance scheme through the severance payment fund to make payments to those individuals. What is little known though is that the management of LIAT under administration has refused to cooperate with those employees, again, the Barbados-based employees, who paid in. So money came out of their paycheck every month, and they're entitled to get it back. But the LIAT administrators refused to cooperate to stop them from getting back their money. The second set of LIAT workers, Madam Chair, are those LIAT workers, largely pilots and some flight attendants, who were employed in Antigua, who paid taxes in Antigua, who paid into the NAS fund of, Ante of the government of Antigua and Barbuda. Government Senator Dr. Lynette Holder has sought to defend the government's decision to borrow significant amounts of money to shore up the island's foreign reserves and spending. In her contribution to the debate on the 2021 Appropriation Bill on a Thursday, Senator Holder said it was government's intention to re-engineer the country for growth coming out of the COVID-19 lockdowns and insisted that the situation was unavoidable given the disruptions to the economy caused by the crisis. With a decline in economic activity, we know that COVID-19 would have affected our um, primary foreign exchange earner, um, uh, tourism to the, to the effect, I believe we, 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 we heard um, data being shared prior to the um, cancellation of, of, of flights, the loss of, of revenue, the bookings for our hotels, and, and by extension, the um, ancillary services that would be affected. So this, this was our reality. So we had to borrow. Government had to intervene within the economy and make sure that we had the money to shore up our expenditure. But what he neglected, Mr. President, to share is that that could only have happened because of the prudent management of the economy for the last 21 months. There's regional and international news after this short break. Barbados Today, news you can trust. To news from our Caribbean neighbors now, Guyana's COVID-19 death toll climbed to 225 after the country recorded four more virus-related deaths within a 24-hour period on Thursday. Gordon Mosley of News Source Guyana picks up the story. Three of the four persons who passed away lived in Region 4, which continues to see the highest rate of COVID-19 infections in the country. All four of the latest COVID-19 related deaths were patients in the ICU of the Infectious Diseases Hospital at Lilienthal. They were all over the age of 60. Since the start of this month, Guyana has recorded more than 1,200 new cases of coronavirus, and 28 deaths have been recorded in the past 24 days. The latest data from the Ministry of Health has revealed 78 new cases of the virus being recorded in the past 24 hours. More than 40 of those new cases are from Region 4. 
On the international front, the COVID-19 pandemic has reversed development gains for millions of countries, creating an even more sharply unequal world. That's according to the findings of a new United Nations report released on a Thursday, issued by the Interagency Task Force on Financing. Here is Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. The message of the report is clear and it's stark. COVID-19 is the leading uh, uh, sharply bifurcated world, leaving hundreds of millions of people behind and putting the development agenda seriously at risk without immediate action on financing for development. The pandemic has caused the worst recession in 90 years and disproportionately affected the most vulnerable segments of our societies, including women and youth. We're seeing between 119 and 124 million people estimated to be the newly pushed into extreme poverty. And the world has lost the equivalent of 255 million full-time jobs. Today's new report puts forward important recommendations. It calls on governments to invest in people, social protection, sustainable infrastructure and green jobs. It also calls on the international community to support the poorest and most vulnerable countries with debt relief and other measures to ensure liquidity, including the allocation of additional special drawing rights. That's news. But for the very latest, visit us at www.barbidestoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.